Hey, Dave Arnold from Booker Index, and a lot of people ask me questions about carbonation systems. So I'm just gonna do a video. It's gonna be super long and boring, and so I'm gonna try to go as fast as possible. Over here, I'm gonna write uh, where you can go in the video to see whatever part you in particular need. And sometimes I'll go like this, and I'll point to a part about where you can buy it or what the part number is so you can write it down. Now, uh, I've seen a lot of videos recently on the internet, people making mistakes when they're setting up a carbonation system at home. So I'm gonna show you over the last 20, 25 years, I've set up a lot of these systems, and so I just kinda wanna show you how I think you should do it right. Now, the heart of any carbonation system is, of course, the carbonator. Now, I'll do a separate video some other time about how to do hand carbonation systems, but for today, we're talking about carbonated water on tap. And this is the McCann carbonator, the big boy. This is the one that everyone kind of gets. Now they're relatively expensive new, but you can get these used every time a restaurant shuts down, they kind of throw these away and I've never really seen one break. The one that I have, uh, back I'm gonna show you in a minute that's working, has been in use for 20 years, no problem. So what do we have here? What are the parts of a carbonator? So most importantly is this stainless steel tank. This is where the carbonated water sits. Now. All the time when your water is sitting in here, it is at room temperature, right? And that's gonna be very important later because we're gonna to have to talk about chilling. It's gonna be at room temperature inside of this and it stays pretty much about half full of carbonated water and the rest of it is gonna be carbon dioxide gas, all right? So this tank is where all the magic happens. And this is, and we're gonna be carbonating typically at about um, 100 PSI, somewhere around 100 pounds per square inch. Sorry, metric people. Um, it's about 100 PSI. So your water pressure from your house is not nearly 100 PSI. And so what you need is you need a pump. And this pump, the carbonator pump, takes water in from wherever you're getting water from and then puts it under high pressure into the carbonated tank. When you then take carbonated water out, this is a sensor that sticks down and as soon as the carbonated water level gets too low, it turns this pump on boom, and pumps water into your tank. And that's how carbonation works, okay? Pro tip, these things are relatively indestructible except if you run this pump dry. What I mean is never run this pump without water in it. If you run this pump without water, you will ruin this. Now you can buy this section. These pumps are made by the Procon Corporation and it's the same kind of pump they use in espresso machines. They're hard, heavy duty industrial workhorses, but you can never run them dry. Something else uh, to pay attention to, we're gonna be talking about filters as well. Uh, when your filter starts clogging up, uh, water can't get into the pump very fast and you'll notice your pump gets louder and louder. So as your pump gets louder when it's refilling, that's a sign to you to change your filter. And I'm gonna show you the filters and how changing that works. And you should always filter the water that goes into one of these things because any little bit of chlorine or anything else that gets into here is really, really gonna pop when it's carbonated. So you wanna filter your water, but you don't wanna buy a filter that is extremely, extremely fine. You just wanna do it for taste. If you're not willing to drink your water, then probably you, can, you should carbonate with bottled water and you can do that. You can put this into a thing of bottled water and suck it and carbonate that way. But as long as you're willing to drink your water, I use New York City tap water, I have a filter that's just gonna get rid of stuff like chlorine, taste and smell, and it also lasts a long time and gets good flow. If you don't have good flow, you won't have good uh, carbonation. Now you come in here and take a look at uh, some of these parts. There are a bunch of things on the carbonator and they can get a little bit confusing. So coming out of the, this is, remember this is the sensor. There's a plug on the sensor and I'm gonna be using that in a, in a little bit. This is the water in, filtered water comes in, pumps through here, comes out here. This is permanently installed. And then this is a back pressure valve. If something goes wrong and this pressure gets too high, it will spit water out here. It should never spit water out of here. If it spits water out of here, you have a problem, but it is nice to put a little hose on that um, to take care of it. This valve ensures that water and CO2 never go back into your plumbing system, all right? This is a check valve to go back. Now I want you to notice something. This is brass. Right? This happens to be stainless because it's nice and fancy, but nothing after this can be brass. And this is very important. I see a lot of people on the internet using brass fittings. Anything that touches carbonated water cannot be made out of copper or brass. At the very least, it'll make the stuff taste terrible. And if it sits for a long time uh, with a lot of brass, it can poison you. So please, please, stainless only after this point, all right? So then now, 
We have the gas that comes in, sorry, the water that comes in. So this is the water into the tank and you're never gonna be messing with this. And then there's these four things on the top of the tank. The small one that comes off to the side is carbon dioxide. This is where your gas comes in from your tank. These two are water out. They need to both be capped. So you can either get a cap fitting, that's not the right size, or I see some people, they make a little fake plug and they put it uh, over the top, right? But either you need two water lines to come out of here, or you need to cap this one or water's gonna spray everywhere. It's gonna be your worst nightmare. And then the last thing here, this is a little relief valve. And I'm gonna show you, if you were to open this when it was under pressure, it would go and I'm gonna show you how we uh, use that actually for the first time you ever start up um, a system. Now, uh, I want you to look, can you look and see real close here? See this shape of this? This is called a flare fitting. So a lot of people kind of wonder what kind of fittings you're using. These are flare fittings, right? And you're gonna buy these either from, um, you, I would you, like normally, you would get most of your weird fittings and stuff on like a website called McMaster Car. And if you've never heard of McMaster Car, you're welcome. Go look on their website. They have almost everything that you're ever gonna need to build stuff, but not for soda. If you wanna buy stuff like flare fittings, some homebrew shops do carry them, but I always go to Mark Powers and Company in Guntersville, Alabama. Uh, they will deal with non-businesses, or if you are a business, Fox Beverage out of Kansas City can also uh, send you some good stuff, so go to them and they can get all of these parts. But the way a flare fitting works is you have two different parts. You have the flare nut, the, sw the swivel, and then you have the actual barb fitting. And these are, can you get in there and see that real close? See how this is angled, right? So this angle is meant to fit, and I'll get one that's the same size uh, as this. This angle is meant to fit directly on that. And that's how the seal is formed. And so you order, you order based on this, and that goes with whatever nut size. So this is a quarter inch flare nut. This is a quarter inch barb. And it goes in there, and then that screws on and tightens it. And it's this flare that actually makes the seal. And all soda systems are stainless steel flare fittings. Now, another thing I see a lot of people make a mistake is they think that they're gonna seal these things with Teflon tape. You never wanna see Teflon tape in a, in a CO2 setup, right? Instead, you use these little washers. And these little washers, and they come in different colors, this is a quarter inch, you put that over the flare and into the flare nut. Let me see if I got one here. And that is a completed flare, and that's gonna last forever, and it's never gonna leak and does not require any Teflon. All the sealing is done by this little plastic washer. And I'll build one of those in, in a second. Um, okay, next, big rookie mistake people make on the CO2 that goes in is the regulator. So this is a regulator I see people buy all the time and see how fast you can catch what's wrong with it. Hmm. I'll let you know. See here, there's two main sections of a, of a regulator. This is called the primary and this measures the tank pressure. A little more about that in a second. And this is the secondary. This is the pressure that you're getting uh, out and putting into your carbonator. Now, most beer people, beer heads, don't need pressures that are that high. So a beer regulator only goes up to 60 PSI, and this is a beer regulator. Carbonation regulators need to go over 100 PSI. So you wanna make sure the ones that I use are 160 PSI regulators. Um, 125 would probably also do, but I get 160 PSI. So that is a huge mistake people make. They get the wrong regulator, and then they're in for a world of hurt. They're never gonna have a good carbonation. Also, uh, if you're gonna be moving around a lot with a regulator, it's a good idea to buy a cage because these things are relatively fragile and they get hit. And then you can see this one got hit even with a cage on it and it got bent and you know it's kind of a, a pain in the butt. But you buy this cage separately and uh, Mark Powers and Company has that and you can get it uh, off their website and it just screws in with a standard quarter 20 nut. Now let's take a look over here at this. This is the part of the regulator. This is the part of the regulator that goes onto the carbon dioxide tank. And if you look through, it goes directly from the carbon dioxide tank, the gas, and it is measured in this high pressure regulator, the primary. And then the ones that come off on an angle like this are your secondary, and this is the actual gas uh, that, you're, that you're using. So 
This part of the regulator has a little seal on it. That rubber seal is prone to fail a lot. This kind of fitting, the, the name for it is CGA 130. They're very specific carbon dioxide. Get this little washer, this CO2 washer, and always have one of these around. Because if you don't have one of these around and this fails, it's gonna leak and it's gonna cause problems. So I always, always have one of these white CO2 guys to make sure that I'm not gonna leak, right? And then that screws directly into the CO2 tanks. Now let's take a look at the CO2 tanks. This is a soda stream tank. I don't use them. If you're going away for, to a party or something, you can take it and you can buy a regulator. You have to do your own Google food for that. You can buy a regulator that will fit on a soda stream tank uh, and take it with you to carbonated parties, but whatever, we won't be talking about that today. These are your standard CO2 tanks. This is a five pound tank. This is a 20 pound, I think it's 20, maybe it's 10. This is a 10 pound tank, 20 is a little higher. Um, in general, if you can fit a 20 pound tank, 20 pound tank is the most economical, right? They all have these. You try to go to a place, you get these refilled at welding shops, that puts a, a little plastic thing over this just to keep it clean and so you know which ones are full and which are empty. And when you have one that you know is full or empty, put a piece of tape on it so that you know, uh, because you can't really tell, unless you have a scale that can weigh them, you can't accurately tell um, how full they are. Okay, um, and then when I show you, another classic mistake people make is they think that they, think that they can tell how much gas they have left in their tank based on what it says on the regulator, but I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. Now, uh, last, well, second to last thing I want you to look at when you're buying stuff is the hose that you get. So this hose is the hose that a lot of people uh, sell on the, on the internet, especially beer people want you to buy this. I hate this hose. I would never use this hose. You can use it for gas, but never put carbonated liquid through this hose. This hose is made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, and from a health perspective, it's not that I'm a health nut on PVC, it's that I've never had PVC hose that didn't impart taste to your product. So I've had people swear on a stack of Bibles that it wasn't gonna make my uh, seltzer taste bad. And I think for beer and soda people who are have, adding a lot of flavor to their liquids, they can get away with PVC. But a couple of years ago, I had to rip out an entire system and I spent two days on my back rewiring an entire seltzer system because someone had tried to convince me that PVC hose didn't taste bad anymore and it was okay and they were wrong. So for gas, you can use this PVC. Notice this one is, is a polyester braid reinforced PVC. But, and this, is, this tube is still working even though it's like 25 years old. I got it when it was used. It's yellow and it's old but this is the kind of hose you should be using. It's polyethylene core with, an, with a braid reinforcement and uh, some kind of coating on the outside, which I believe uh, EVA or something like this. I forget exactly what the outside. The outside doesn't really matter as much. You need the polyester reinforcement and the polyethylene on the inside. You can see how that's two layers. That's two layers on the hose. And this hose, this hose will never break. This hose will never put bad flavors into your product. This is the only hose you should put carbonated liquids through ever. You should never use any other hose for carbonated liquid. I can't stress this enough. Do not use a different hose. Even if the person on the phone tries to tell you that you should use a different hose, do not use a different hose. Now, uh, how are you gonna connect these hoses? I use these things. Uh, in America, we call them Oedeker clamps. And if you were German, you'd pronounce them Erdiger clamps. That's how you spell it. Uh, and these things are really awesome. Let's say I'll, make a, I'll make a hose uh, for you. So let's say I was making a hose. Now remember, I told you, you want your washer here. Let's make up a hose. So I'll screw on. You wanna screw it on like this so that you know roughly where it's gonna lie. Then you get your Oedeker clamp and they're all different sizes depending on what hose you're using. And the person you're buying them from, if you're buying them from Mark Powers or whatnot, can tell you um, kind of what sizes to get. And these you can get on McMaster. And then you push it on to your, to your barb fitting, but not all the way. You see how I left a little space there? I did that on purpose. This way, when I'm loosening this, I can actually loosen it easily. If I didn't do that, this swivel would bind on there and make it very difficult. Now here, you might not want to invest in these, but you really should. These are um, Knipex 
one of my favorite tool manufacturers in the world, and they make these Oetker clamp pl uh, pliers, and these are the ones to get. The red handle, there's a blue handle that's garbage. Get the red handle. I've never met someone who's like, oh, you know, I wish I didn't have that. And then you can either come in from the top like this and take a look. Can you see it? Yeah. And squeeze it, and that's it. That's on forever, right? I hate the ones with the little, the little, I hate the ones where you have to screw them like this. Those things, you're always cutting yourself, they leak, they cut into the hose. This is a fantastic hose connection. It's perfectly tight all the way around. And if you ever need to get it off, so now I can unscrew this. If you ever need to get it off, you just come in with the side of your, of your uh, Oetker clamp. And, let's see. Yeah. Of course, it's a pain in the butt because I'm trying to do it on the camera. And that's it. It's off. So it just comes right off. They're very cheap. And then you just buy new ones and you're good to go. Okay, so let me clear this stuff out and I'll talk about the last important thing, which is the tap, what you actually use to um, put the seltzer through. Because this is another thing people really, really do a bad job of. All right, so here is a classic valve with a compensator and this is what you're gonna wanna use on a seltzer system, um, not some sort of picnic valve or even what most people bars use, which is a, called a bar gun. And it doesn't have to be this one. I'll show you a different one that I have on my system that I have installed on my sink. But the heart of this is this compensator valve here. So you want to look, and I want you to be able to see that this tapers in. This is a, not just this taper here, but there's also a taper on this side. It tapers in. And then it has these little things to, to hold. And what happens is, is that there's a valve in here that this actuates, right? And when that happens, the seltzer water comes in here, goes around this compensator, spreads out, and that allows it, without losing all of its bubbles, to get from a high pressure area to a low pressure area out here without losing all of your carbonation. Now, the key thing is, is that this valve that operates like this, it's not actually pushing on this. In fact, all this is doing, this taper, all this taper is doing when it moves in and out is adjusting how big the area that the seltzer water goes through. And so there's a little screw here, and this is the important part, and you can see every compensator valve either has a screw or a little arm on it. And what this screw does is, is the more you screw it in, righty tighty, the more you screw it in, the further back it's pushing this compensator. And that means it's shutting off, making it slower, the seltzer water. And when you unscrew it and make it loose, this is coming further out and allowing more seltzer water to come through. So this is the heart of a good carbonation system. Um, this is where a lot of people fail. They don't get a decent valve and you really want a decent valve that's just used for soda and i'll show you the one that i have over on my system and let's go over this system and i'll show you the cold plate all right so this is the actual valve that i use on my carbonation system so this is like a nice it's called an ibis beer tower i got this one from fox beverage company and then this is the valve that I was telling you about. This is actually, I believe, a beer valve, but it's got the same compensator inside of it that the other one uh, did that I told you about. And on this one, you adjust the compensator with this little arm, uh, and then the seltzer comes out of it like that. Now, I recommend that when you're installing this, that you install it so that it goes into your sink. This way, when they're spilling, it goes in, and you don't have to have a whole separate drain line. Uh, if you're going through all the trouble of installing a carbonation system, you probably want to also do filter, filter chilled water. So I recommend putting a water filler also um, on your sink. And it's really convenient to keep these all near the sink. The one thing you want to be sure is make sure you have access to the bottom of this. Because if anything ever goes wrong, and I've had it happen, where a fitting fails or a tube slips off, you're going to be having 100 PSI carbonated water spraying everywhere, and you're going to want to be able to get to it and fix it really quickly. All right. So I, uh, I have an ice machine, and I've installed my cold plate, which is the last part of the system I haven't shown you yet. And here's the cold plate. 
So the cold plate is just a block of aluminum, and on the inside of the aluminum is a bunch of coiled stainless steel tubing. Uh, and then there's fittings that are coming out. Now these are also flare and barb fittings. These fittings usually come when you order the cold plate. So just make sure that it comes with the proper flare fittings and you just need to tell them what kind of tubing you're taking off. I use quarter inch tubing. Um, so you just wanna make sure when you're ordering your cold plate that they tell you what size barbs are coming off of it. And I highly recommend quarter inch. Uh, now, mine's real fancy. So I have this ice machine. I've drilled a hole in the side of the ice machine and it comes in and goes to the cold plate. Um, I don't even necessarily recommend it just because ice machines are not only expensive, they're also kind of loud and they're inefficient. Um, you could do something easily with a, a box that you just put ice in and then um, have a drain in it and then put this in an insulated box. And I, I ran that way for years and years and years. Right. Well, so the important thing here is that for seltzer water, especially that you run the seltzer water through two circuits of your cold plate. So this has three what's called circuits, in, out, three times, one, two, three, in, out. So what you wanna do is cold, uh, sorry, warm seltzer comes in, goes through a circuit of the cold plate, comes out, goes back into the cold plate. You see that short loop? Goes through it again and comes out. Now, why is that important? You want a, a double loop because it's gonna make the temperature a lot colder and the colder your seltzer is, the better your seltzer is, the more bubbles it will have, also the more refreshing it is. Uh, and secondly, going through that longer line means it's, it's gonna have an easier time coming out without foaming and losing all of, its, um, all of its bubbles. Now, if you're putting a cold plate in, you might as well go ahead and put a couple of extra circuits. I only have one extra here, and that extra circuit is for filtered water. So I, don't, I only run that through once because I don't really care how cold my flat water is. Anyway, uh, all right, so if you're gonna do this, I would recommend maybe getting, like I say, you can just build an insulated box with a drain in it uh, and then you know put a cold plate in that. But you do need some way to chill the water. And I can talk later on more about alternate ways of chilling, but this is where everyone thinks they can get away with not doing a good job and they're wrong. And uh, I'll, I'll show you how this works. So in the real life, when this is running, there's ice on top of it. That ice continuously melts. Uh, and every time I draw on the seltzer arm, it's melting. The melting ice is extremely powerful, chilling, chills it down very, very, very quickly. And if you were to buy a box and just have an insulated box, a regular freezer ice machine is more than capable in a day of making enough ice to run your, uh, your seltzer for a family of at least four. All right, now, one more thing that a lot of people mess up and see whether we can get way down underneath. If you're gonna have a cold plate, uh, or anything like that, you're going to need, unless you have a floor drain, you're gonna need a condensate pump. So this pump is on the floor of the kitchen and whenever the ice melts in your system, the ice, uh, the melting water will drain into this pump and it gets pumped back up and into your drain, the same place that the washing, uh, that your dishwasher uh, would drain. So in my house, I have a espresso machine that also uses this uh, drip pump. I have my ice maker that uses um, this drip pump. If you're lucky enough to have a floor drain, you can get away without it, but you know, please don't, please don't forget that. All right, now let's look at the heart of the system and let's show you how to start one of these up. All right, so here we are under the sink and I'm gonna show you how to fire up your carbonator for the first time and also uh, how to do the filter. We wanna take care of that, make sure it's right. Now, um, this is my filtered water output and whenever you're doing plumbing and you have the choice of installing, install quarter turn valves. These allow you to just turn things off and on with a quarter turn. Okay, so uh, we gotta turn off, and I have a lot of water fittings under here, so it's a little confusing. I hate these fittings, I didn't install them. But you gotta turn off the water to your filter. That won't be a problem if it's brand new, but then just make sure that, in fact, you have turned off the water. So make sure you're depressurized and here I've tested it and make sure the water is off. Make sure that you have a, um, make sure that you have a bucket under here. This is my, that's my espresso machine pump. Make sure you have a bucket to catch the water uh, as it drips because water will drip. Um, some machines allow you to um, switch the water off to bypass it. I don't use that because I've had that fail. And always keep this wrench. This wrench comes with your water filter. Keep it. 
and you also have to think about what you're doing. Pretend that you're staring, well, pretend that you're staring up at it and think the correct kind of righty tighty lefty loosey. I always think about it a little bit because what you don't want to do is over tighten this unit because then you can crack it and then you're going to be in a world of hurt later on. All right. Now, once it's a little bit loose, you can loosen it up and it should come off fairly easily. Oh, yeah. All right. And you always spill a little bit. I'll have to get a, a towel and stuff always flies off and it always looks terrible and gross. But what you want to do is take your old filter and that's grody and old and, and make sure you keep tracks. Some filters have sidedness and some don't. This one does not. So it doesn't matter what direction it's in, but just check. Also make sure that you don't lose or damage this O-ring. That O-ring is super important. Another note, a lot of things people make a mistake of is they put their, um, they put their filter in a place that they can't easily get to it and then it can't be changed. And since you know you have to change them all the time, uh, make sure they're easy to get to. Let me rinse this out. I'm gonna use hot water because I haven't turned the hot water off. And now I have the new filter and I've soaked it to get some of the initial carbon out of it. And then you, here's another important thing. You wanna make sure that it fits right down in there because if it doesn't fit nicely on this rubber grommet, it's not gonna work. So this is what it should look like before it goes back on. Be careful, put the ring on it before you put it into your bucket. Let me get a towel to wipe that down. All right. Nothing's more fun on a weekend than working under your sink. And these stains are just from years of um, redoing the filters. All right, so get it back where it's gonna go. All right, now, you want to be a little bit careful here to get it to thread on straight. You don't want to cross-thread it. Uh, I don't want to go... Yeah. Imagine yourself underneath it, righting and tighting and lefting and loosing. You just want to make sure you get it right. All right, so now I have it pretty tight, hand tight. I'm just take it hold the top so you don't put too much torque on it. You don't want to torque these plastic things too hard. And you want just enough tension on it that it doesn't leak. You don't want to go gorilla on it because you can crack it. All right, now we're going to turn the water on. And you can see it fill up. See how it fills up? But it's still not ready yet. There's still air trapped in here. And so every one of these suckers somewhere has a vent button. I'll be darned if I can find it on this one right now. But they all have a vent somewhere that you're supposed to press to get the air out. The air inside of your filter is going to be a nightmare enemy. Man, but I can't for the life of me. Maybe it's under here. Yeah, here. There's a vent. Ready? Now, I know this looks violent. Can you see it? See how water's not really coming out, air's coming out? A good idea, now that I don't care whether you see it anymore, is to cover it with a towel so that it doesn't spray all over everything. You hear how no more air's, see, hear it? Now it sounds like water, not like air. And then it's even like, it's good practice to uh, wait a couple of minutes and then burp it again to try to make sure that you've gotten all the air out because you really don't want any air at all in your water system. All right, now, oh, wrong way, people. All right, so now another good practice is you're gonna wanna come back, and I just sprayed this with water, right? So it's hard to see what's going on. 
but you're gonna wanna come back in an hour or two and just make sure that you're not leaking water. All of this should be, after an hour or two, bone dry. If it leaks and I've had it happen, you need to take the whole thing apart and do it again. You could try to give it a little more of a tighten, but if it takes any more than just a little bit extra tightening, it means you have a problem and you need to fix it. All right, so now we have the water going. Now, remember, you have the filtered water. I have my manifold here. I have the filtered water going to the seltzer machine. Now I'm gonna pretend, here's the, here's the, here's, here's the, the issue, let's turn this off, right? Let me turn this off, invent this. So the first thing we're gonna do is you don't have your water in, unplug your seltzer. Don't have your seltzer uh, carbonator plugged in. This is how I unplug it. I just take these pins apart like this. Now there's no more sensor, that motor will never kick on. Because remember, the last thing you want on earth is for that motor to run dry. So I've turned off my, here, I'll move this out of the way. So I've turned off my carbonator here, right? Now, I have the water on and I'm gonna fill this with water by just hitting this vent button. You see that vent? You hear that water going in? It won't normally make this much noise. It's just making this much noise because my CO2 is hooked up. Oh, see that? Let me, let me uh, run it from up here. I'm trying to fill the whole system with water. No gas, just water. All right, you see that water spraying out? The whole thing is full of water now. Now, why did I do that? Air, air is the enemy of carbonation. So what you don't ever want is for there to be any air in this thing at all, no air. So the only way you can, when, you're at, when you hook it up again later and you've already purged it of air, there's no air in it, you don't need to go through that step again. But the first time you use it, you have to get rid of all of the air. So the way that I do it is I fill it completely with water. It's filled completely with water now. Now, here's the next step. Now we hook up the gas. So here's my old gas. I just want you to look at something real quick. See how the gas is on here? And right here, this is the main, the primary. It's down at zero. And all I have left is 40 PSI. That's nothing. That's not enough to carbonate with. But let's hook it up and you can see how far it goes. These again, Lefty Lucy. Also, try not to go too gorilla on uh, on these either, because you need to use them again and again. So you need to write empty on this, which I'll do in a minute. Here's a full tank. Notice how it says full. Let me see, you can see it here. Make sure that your, your seal is good. If not, use one of those washers. Make sure you're not cross-threading. Now, don't use like channel lock pliers on these things. Use like a real, I only use Knipex pliers wrenches, but something that's not gonna mar your stuff too much. Hold on to this a little bit like this so it doesn't rotate, and then push down on this. That's kind of all you need. You don't, again, need to go too crazy on it. You're not trying to damage it or deform it, and then Stay away from any parts in case there's a in case there's gas that pressurizes that you don't want it to hit you. Then turn it on. Now, it didn't you didn't hear a lot of gas moving, and the reason you didn't hear a lot of gas moving was because this thing's full of water now. There's no place for the gas to go. But if you see here, we're up around a uh, thousand psi or something like this. This is not a fuel gauge. the The pressure that's in this tank is only dependent on temperature. That's because almost all of this tank up to here is actually filled with liquid carbon dioxide. And the pressure that this gauge reads will read as though the tank is full until it gets all the way down to the bottom and it's only gas left. So a lot of people make the mistake of looking at this and being like, ah, oh, it's full. It's fine. It's good. It's not. You can't tell anything about how much CO2 you have less based on this pressure until it's already down to almost zero. 
This is the one that it's uh, that is important where it's set to, and I have it set to a little over 100 psi. You see that? And that's what I recommend for Seltzer. If you go any higher than that, sometimes you can spring leaks or have problems with some equipment. A little bit over 100 psi, it's a nice place. Uh, and that's with room temperature water that I use. You could carbonate lower if this whole system was in a fridge and you were using a five gallon bucket with ice in it, then you could go down to like 45 but I highly recommend like 100, a little over 100, like 105 PSI, and you have it um, under your sink and it's all easy. Now look, notice how this is still not plugged in, and that's important because this is full of water, but that water is not carbonated. So what we're gonna do is push all of that water out under pressure like this. This is the part that my son hates the most. Hear that noise? That's the gas filling up the space. Make sure you don't have the carbonator on. Make sure it's not plugged in. All right, now I'm gonna fast mow this. now oh yeah oh yeah that's it now here it's still whining Whee. hear it i like to say it sounds like a ship or like a boat now you're almost done now listen if you catch this tank right as it stops before the pressure drops too low I, as soon as the seltzer starts tasting a little bit flat you can just swap the tanks and you don't need to worry about it if your pressure drops too much and you want the seltzer to be 100% right away, all you need to do is that step where you put the new tank on, empty out the water. You don't need to go through that whole thing where you fill it with water first. But the first time you run it, remember, fill it with water, that gets rid of all of the air. Then push all the water out with the CO2. Now it's got nothing but CO2 and no flat water in it. And now you're ready for the moment of truth. Get down here, let's take a look. Now, we have a new filter. So this is what it should sound like. And we have, uh, a completely empty tank and it's gonna make a spark. Alright, let's go up. Now it's gonna take longer than normal to stop because the tank is completely empty completely empty. Usually when it comes on, it's only gonna run for like 10 seconds. I'll wash my hands while I'm waiting. Oh yeah. All right. And that my friends, Okay, gotta wait for the what? Ah, ah, and now, the very first, the very first glass of seltzer, when you install it the way chumps tell you how to do it, and by the way, every instruction I've ever seen on the internet, even the instructions that the company uses, they are chumps. Their first glass of seltzer is not their best glass of seltzer. They say to wait weeks for your seltzer to be perfect. This seltzer, Mm-hmm. <laughs>